Um, I co-edited two volumes about the Red Army faction, which are on the table over there. Uh, the, they're big books, and there's no way I can cover everything in the books tonight, so I'm not even going to try, because it would, like, we'd be here for a week, it would be, you know, you'd all be very bored and very tired by the end of it. Uh, so instead I'm basically just going to tell you, and the books only take up to 1984 so far, we're going to do a third volume which brings up to the end. So but what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to give you the history, kind of a narrative <coughs> form of the Red Army faction, and I'm also going to talk so into it a little bit about two other armed organizations which were active in West Germany at the time, to kind of give a contrast uh, and give some more context. So the Red Army faction was what we would call an urban guerrilla organization or an armed struggle organization, what the state refers to as a terrorist organization. It was active in West Germany in the 1970s and 80s. And like a lot of things that, you know, on the left from the 1970s and 80s, its roots can be found in the 60s. So in this time of around the world of like revolt, revolution, protest, change. Uh, and, you know, when I say that the Red Army faction was active in West Germany, the reason I say West Germany and not Germany is because for roughly half of the 20th century, uh, you know, the country of Germany was actually two countries, East Germany, West Germany. East Germany was allied to the Soviet Union as a part of the Warsaw Pact, and it was hostile to West Germany, which was allied with the United States and a part of NATO. And a weird thing was, right in the middle of East Germany, you had the city of Berlin, which was cut in two by a wall, and the west half of Berlin, even though it was in the middle of East Germany, it was basically a part of West Germany. And it was also allied to NATO and the United States and everything. And there were international agreements. There was basically one highway that East Germany had to keep open to allow people to drive in and out of West Germany. Uh, and it was a surreal scene. You'd have, you know, East Bloc military, you know, lining the highway, you know, and when you were in West Germany, it was a very intense scene. You'd have the Berlin Wall, you'd have East German soldiers guarding the Berlin Wall, and all of this kind of thing. And because of this intensity, because it was like a weird place to live, and because West Germany overall was really conservative, when this wave of revolt, like the 60s revolt, when it comes to West Germany, it really just comes to West Berlin at first. It's like West Berlin's like a couple of years ahead of the rest of the country. And when things are changing really quickly, if you're a couple of years ahead, it's like, you know, it's a different world kind of thing. So West Berlin was really the place to be in the 60s. Uh, you had developing a counterculture scene kind of built around, you know, sex and drugs and music and communes beginning to be formed. Uh, young people experimenting with different ways of living. And then you also had a small student movement, uh, which, you know, started taking to the streets, protesting things like the war in Vietnam, protesting when foreign dignitaries who were involved in bad stuff would visit West Berlin. Uh, in one kind of watershed moment in 1967, the Shah of Iran, Iran was at the time like an American ally, so the Shah, the kind of the king of Iran visit, visits West Berlin, there's a demonstration against him, and this kid who was at his first demonstration gets shot through the head by an undercover police officer. Uh, so, you know, this, you know, people just freak out. You know, it's a very small student movement. It's a very small radical left. People feel they're under siege. They feel that they're up against, you know, their parents' generation or their grandparents' generation who were like Nazis kind of thing. They really feel, you know, it's a, it's a do or die kind of situation. And, you know, that's not, I mean, that's the demonstration that gets attacked in the most brutal way, but demonstrations in general are often being attacked by police. So some people start going to demonstrations with the idea, you know, prepared to be attacked, and then some people start going to demonstrations with the idea that, you know, they're prepared to fight back, so they bring things, they bring, you know, Molotov cocktails to demonstrations, and then some of those people figure, well, why just go to a demonstration with a Molotov cocktail, why not go out in the middle of the night when there's, you know, no cops around and do something with a Molotov cocktail, so you have, really quickly, in the late 60s, you have a development and escalation of political violence, kind of thing. And you have 
this occurring in a very natural kind of way, without anybody putting out a rule book or saying we have to do this just based on people's personal experiences. At the same time, on the edge of this countercultural scene, on the edge of the student movement, there's some people who, you know, they know all of the people in the communes and, you know, but they, they kind of have a self-perception that they're more serious, maybe they think they're a bit smarter or, or whatever kind of thing. And they also have an idea that this political violence thing that's good, they think, but they also think it's too important just to let it develop on its own kind of thing. They feel it actually needs to be consciously pushed forward by people like them. So the form this takes in 1968 is four people traveled from West Berlin to Frankfurt, which is in West Germany, and they plant firebombs uh, with timing devices in two department stores, time to go off after the stores close. <coughs> and they do go off after the stores close and you know, basically create these big fires. There's a tremendous amount of damage. Uh, but even though they thought they were, you know, maybe smarter and more serious than the others, you know, their security obviously wasn't great because the cops, you know, knew who'd done it almost right away, and they were arrested the next day. Uh, and they <coughs> Why didn't they pick the stores? Well, they in their trial they said that they firebombed these stores. You know, they were just random department stores kind of thing. There was nothing special about them, but they said they did it as a tax in solidarity with the people in Vietnam and in the context of the Vietnam War. And even though the stores themselves weren't involved, you know, in the Vietnam War, I think there was a sense that West Germany was complicit in US war crimes in Vietnam. So any kind of attack against anything in West Germany could be explained that way. Uh, but it was, you know, it was a confused kind of action. And they kind of acknowledged that in their trial while saying that it was a political action, they kind of acknowledged that, yeah, people hadn't really understood, it wasn't super well thought out. Uh, they're kept in jail during their trial, so for a year they're in jail while they're on trial, and they're found guilty, which is kind of obvious, they were going to be found guilty. And, but then at the end of their trial, their lawyer appeals, and the court decides to let them out pending the appeal. So suddenly they're out again, and three of the four people decide they're not going back to jail. Uh, because it's kind of obvious their appeals have been turned down, but they're like, we're not going back to jail. And these three uh, were Thor this guy Thorwald Prohl, uh, and this woman Gudrun Enslin, and her boyfriend, this guy Andreas Bader. And their appeal is turned down, and Prohl kind of changes his mind, he turns himself in, but Enslin and Bader don't, so they're suddenly living underground, which, you know, what that means at that time for them you know, in a world without internet, without ATMs, without security cameras everywhere. It's just that they're avoiding the police. And they are, you know, staying at various people's houses, not, you know, not doing anything in their own name, and, you know, trying to avoid being arrested. And that's fairly easy for them to do this, evidently, because they spend the next year, basically, you know, couch surfing, staying at various people's homes. Uh, they travel in and out of the country. They go to France, they go to Italy, and really what they do for this year is they're talking to people. They're talking to people about how like we gotta fight against the government and we need to build a guerrilla group. We need to, you know, be able to resist uh, in an armed kind of way. Uh, but it's largely, you know, it's largely just talk. And lots of people find it really interesting, these various people who let them sleep on their couch or who lend them a bed for a night. But, uh, you know, it's unclear what would have happened except that in 1970 uh, an undercover police officer in West Berlin spots Andreas Bader and sets him up to be arrested. And he is arrested and suddenly this kind of amorphous scene which had been talking a lot have kind of, they're at a crossroads because, you know, this guy who was saying all of this stuff is now in prison. So the question is, you know, do we just let that happen or do we try and do something about it? And evidently some of them figured, well, actually, you know, it wasn't just talk, they want to do something about this. So the form this takes is one of the people who'd let them stay at her house, uh, what happened to be probably the best known left wing female intellectual in West Germany at the time. Uh, her, she was a journalist, uh, she was on TV regularly, her name was Ulrika Meinhof. And she writes a letter 
to the prison where Bob is <coughs> alive, and she says, you know, hi, it's Ulrika Meinhof, I'm uh, a journalist, I'm doing this book, uh, and also this film about kids in reform school, which was true, she was. And she also says one of your prisoners, Andreas Bader, before he was in prison, before he went underground and all of this stuff, he was doing political work with kids in reform school, which was also true. So she says, I'd like to interview him as part of my research. And she asks and the prison agrees. And so the form this takes is that Bader is brought under armed guard to this library of social sciences in West Berlin. Meinhof shows up. They sit down together, they open the books, they pretend to be, you know, discussing, you know, her research and everything. And then four other people show up, and these four people have ski masks on and they have guns. Uh, yeah, and uh, this old man who worked at the library tries to push them away, and one of them raises a gun and shoots him in the stomach. Uh, and he's he doesn't die, but he's badly hurt. So suddenly, the guards take out their guns, people are punching the guards, then people are jumping out a window, there's a woman waiting in a car outside, they jump into the car, and miraculously they all get away, uh, and none of them are hurt. Uh, and, you know... Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was, the, you know, it was... It was everyone 19, was doing it. It was 1970. <laughs> Not everyone was doing it, but like there was a degree of unpreparedness on the part of the state kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, it wasn't that everyone was doing it. Like, when we were researching our first volume, we found the fact that they managed to do this made the newspapers, like, you know, we're in Canada, all of these Canadian newspapers had articles, in the States, all of these newspapers had articles. So, you know, even though it wasn't a prison break, it was like a library break kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, it caught people's attention. And the various reporters writing about this, they only knew about this guy, Andreas Bader, who'd been broken out of prison. And this journalist, Ulrika Meinhof, who'd, hi, who'd, uh, who'd, you know, was involved in breaking him out. Uh, so they call him the Bader Meinhof gang. And, uh, like, the folks involved hated the name, but it's a name that they could never shake. Like, to this day, you know, the movie came out a few years ago, it was called The Bader Meinhof Complex and all of this. So, uh, you know, they write a letter to this radical left-wing newspaper in which, in very romantic terms, they explain that they'd just broken Andreas Bader out of, you know, I... Uh, oh, sorry, we're going That's okay. We, we just started kind of thing, so it's... Uh, well, Rika Meinhof and some other folks have just broken Andreas Bader out of a library, essentially. Uh, Andreas Bader was this prisoner in West Berlin, and it's 1970, and this journalist, Ulrika Meinhof, and some other people have managed to spring him. He was at a library. And uh, they write a letter to this radical left-wing newspaper in which they say in very romantic terms, grandiose terms, about how they would freed Andreas Bader and how, you know, what their politics are like, again, in very flowery, romantic kind of language, and then they end off with a call to like build a red army and everything. So it's, it's very exciting, but essentially what they follow this up by is kind of just a stepped up version of what they were doing before Andres Bader had been arrested, which is sleeping on people's couches or, you know, getting people to lend them their bed and talking to people about how we need to fight against the state and all of this. And they still, you know, they're a kind of larger group now, and you know, some people, you know, are stealing cars in order to get around. They go out of the country again, this time to the Middle East. Uh, this Palestinian group, the PLO, uh, has a training camp in Jordan where they allow these West German, you know, pretty much hippies to, you know, go and shoot some guns and things. And then they travel back to West Berlin and, you know, it's, uh, they rob some banks uh, to get some money. They, during this period, you know, some of them are caught trying to steal cars. So, you know, some people end up in prison. Uh, there's some close calls while robbing banks and things. There's some firefights. Uh, a young woman who's a part of their group is killed. A couple of police are killed. Uh, then in 1971, they do their first big intervention. And what this intervention is, is they release a document. Uh, it's called... It's an essay, it's called The Urban Guerrilla Concept. It's the first document, I think, in which they use the word 
you know, the name Red Army Faction to describe themselves. And essentially what it is, is it's an open letter to the radical left, uh, in which they explain what it is that they think they're doing, and they explain why they think other people should be doing the same kind of thing. And they also kind of give an evaluation of what other folks kind of who came out of the student movement or the movement against the war in Vietnam, where they're at by 1971. So, I mean, in a nutshell, what they say is that all kinds of folks who say they want a revolution uh, say that eventually this will require some kind of armed struggle, some armed component. Uh, but almost everyone says, you know, not now, the time is right now. And what they say in the urban guerrilla concept is normally when you know that eventually you're going to have to do something, you don't wait until that moment to start doing it because then you, you know, you won't really know how to do it. And, you know, they kind of imply also that this is particularly true in the case of armed struggle because it's not only you who has to learn how to do it, the rest of the left, which isn't doing this, have to get used to it and learn how to relate to you doing it. So they actually say, no, you have to start it beforehand. And they also say, you can't know whether or not the time is right or not just by reading or just by talking to people. You actually have to try it. And it's only, you know, the proof will be in the pudding. If it works, in that case, the time was right. If it doesn't work, the time wasn't right. Uh, they also, they, you know, they look around 1971, most of like the student movement, most of the radical left of just a few years earlier, this protest movement had, by 1971, they kind of rallied to the system. Because the thing is, for decades after World War II, the government in West Germany had been a coalition government led by this right-wing political party, the Christian Democrats. And, you know, in the, at the beginning of the 70s, or maybe it was even 69, there was an election that switched to, for the first time, a coalition government led by the Social Democrats. So it kind of seemed like the government had lurched to the left. Uh, and there were various reforms, and so a lot of student radicals uh, decided that, well, maybe we can work within the system. So the RAF see this, and they think this is like a disastrous development, but they also look at the main thing that other people who didn't want to work within the system were doing in the early 70s, and that is they were founding all of these tiny communist political parties, which generally had China or Albania as their reference points. They were like, you know, you can call them Marxist, Leninist, or Maoist political parties. And there were a bunch of them, and they all had the idea that they'd, have a, they'd somehow lead a working class revolution in West Germany. And the RAF addressed these people really respectfully in this document. They called them the proletarian comrades or the proletarian organizations. But essentially what they say is that they, they don't think these groups are very serious. Because, uh, you know, using the examples of this group Gauche Proletarienne in France or the Black Panther Party in the United States, they say these were groups that threatened the government or that the government felt threatened by. And the government managed to crush them through the repression, through setting people up, through, you know, making things illegal, through violence. And these groups were crushed. And so what they say is, if any of these tiny little Maoist parties in West Germany ever actually did manage to threaten the government or make the government or ruling class feel, you know, scared, well, the government knows what to do in that case, you know. And if you don't have, if you haven't prepared a guerrilla, some kind of underground, some way of resisting, you know, being banned or being wiped out, you know, you're not gonna last. And what's more, they say. In West Germany, the question isn't having a communist revolution. They, they say that's just not in the cards. Uh, with the history of the 20th century, they say, you know, some kind of fascism is far more likely. So you actually don't need a guerrilla to have a communist revolution and take power because that's so unlikely. What you need a guerrilla for is to defend yourselves if the government basically, you know, suspends elections, declares martial law, and just tries to wipe out the left. So, you know, they release this and you know, people don't go out and get bombs and guns as a result or join the guerrilla en masse or anything, but a lot of people actually think this is, you know, these aren't just bozos who like to steal cars and rob banks kind of thing. They actually have some kind of politics. You don't have to agree with them, but there's a political idea there, and they kind of establish themselves, you know, as a legitimate part of the radical left, which isn't to say everyone thinks they're right, but people think, you know, their comrades kind of thing. Uh, and they follow this up very much with a year of more of the same. You know, occasionally robbing banks, stealing cars, trying to avoid police. 
till finally in 1972 they're ready to go into action. And the form this takes is a bunch of bombings. They bomb two police stations in retaliation against killer cops. They plant a bomb in a car which belongs to a judge who was in charge of trials of some of their members who'd been arrested. Uh, only it's not him who's driving the car when the bomb goes off, it's his wife, so she's seriously hurt. They plant a bomb in the offices of a right-wing newspaper chain called the Springer Press. It's kind of like a, a print media version of Fox News or something. It was really hated by the student movement. Uh, that's a very controversial bombing because a bunch of people who work for the newspaper are hurt when it goes off. And even people who approve of the idea of armed attacks feel it's really important that not just the people who work for companies doing bad things that are hurt. They feel that, you know, those people, you know, shouldn't be targets. Uh, and, but their other two bombings are actually popular to a certain extent. And that is to say, they bomb two US military bases. Um, and people die in those bombings. It was foreseeable people would die in those bombings. It wasn't like an accident or a mistake. Uh, and in the context, you know, in their communiques, they say this is in the context of the war in Vietnam. Uh, you know, they compare that war to Auschwitz, to like genocide, to the Holocaust. And, you know, it's very clear that as Germans, they feel, you know, Germany is complicit in this kind of thing and that they had a particular like historical duty to, uh, to oppose that. So, you know, I said these last two bombings were popular. But, you know, most people in West Germany probably wanted to bring back the death penalty to deal with them if they were caught kind of thing. Most people in West Germany didn't approve of this. The left, for the most part, didn't approve of it. Trade unions denounced them. The Communist Party denounces them. These little Maoist Communist parties denounce them. Uh, but you do have a bunch of people who actually think, you know, who approve of that kind of thing, who actually, you know, uh, see their politics reflected in these bombings, especially the ones against the military bases. And the RAF, you know, they weren't aiming, remember, they, they didn't feel they'd be able to lead a mass movement, a revolution in West Germany. They were looking, they were aiming at building a minority current. And when you're aiming at building a minority revolutionary or a minority resistance current, the mathematics is all different. It's like normally if I'd say, you alienated 10,000 people, you inspired 200 people, like, you'd, you'd think, well, that's a failure, right? Because you're alienating so many more people than you're, you know, inspiring. But the thing is, there's already millions of people who hate you. You know, that 10,000 people, it's really irrelevant kind of thing. Whereas, you know, because what, what's another 10,000, you know? Uh, but those few hundred people you've inspired, you've potentially doubled or tripled the number of people you know, who are down with your politics. So it's, you know, they don't use exactly that formulation, but I think their history in the 1970s actually shows, you know, and they, they use similar formulations, and it shows that that kind of logic worked for them in the 70s. Uh, and we can see this because, like, these bombings, they're called the May Offensive. They're not called the Summer Offensive or the Spring Offensive, even though they had other stuff planned for June, because most of them are arrested really quickly. That's like police seal off neighborhoods, they go like door to door, they, you know, set up roadblocks all over the place, you know, they really, you know, lock down West Germany and West Berlin. And not everyone in the RAF, but most people in the RAF are arrested over the next few weeks. And one thing that I say again and again when I give this talk is guerrilla organizations use bombs, they use guns, so they use these military means, but they're not primarily military organizations. They're primarily political organizations, and they're a unique kind of political organization, but they really have to be understood that way. So whether or not a bombing works or an assassination works or something like that is in a sense secondary to the political consequences, whether or not the people they're trying to reach understand and approve of their action or, you know, even whether or not they force the state to, you know, act the way that they want the state to act. So we can see this in that 1972, even though most of them are arrested, is just the beginning of their story. It's not the end. Uh, also, from the state's point of view, even like the most vicious military dictatorship 
doesn't maintain power by keeping a gun at everybody's head 24-7. Like most of the time, the state maintains power through political military means. And so when the West German government had these people in prison, it, you know, that was a military victory for it perhaps, but it wanted a political victory. It wanted these people to recant. It wanted these people to say, I'm sorry. Or if they wouldn't say, I'm sorry, it wanted them to appear in a really unfavorable light. Uh, preferably as like deranged lunatics kind of thing. And it used a bunch of things to try and do this, but one of them which really emerged as central in the RAF's history uh, is also one that's also really weird for me to talk about in the United States uh, because it's so widespread here today, but they started experimenting with the systematic use of solitary confinement. Mm -hmm. So, you know, today, like, as I'm, I'm sure many of you know, like in the US, any given day, there's 100,000 people in solitary confinement. And some of them have been there for years, some of them have been there for decades. It's like on a scale never before known in human history. And solitary confinements existed for ages, but, you know, historically it was often just something that, you know, a sadistic warden or a sadistic prison official would use, you know, or something would be done just to, you know, punish someone with solitary, but wasn't used generally in a systematic way to try and get people to renounce their beliefs. And what you see in the early 70s is you see the West German government one of the first governments that start experimenting and studying, can we get people to renounce their beliefs by using solitary confinement? And, you know, the RAF prisoners are kind of unwilling guinea pigs in this experiment. So what this can mean is it can mean, you know, what you'd imagine it means, you're alone in a cell. Uh, in some cases, you're alone in a cell and they empty the cells around you. Uh, and in the most extreme cases, uh, which is what happened to this woman, Astrid Prohl, and then after her to Rita Meinhof, they emptied out an entire wing of a prison. So one after another, each of these women was alone in a prison wing. And, you know, they, they painted Ulrike Meinhof's cell white. They left the lights on 24-7, which again is super common today in supermaxes in the United States, but was at the time, you know, you know, a part of why it's common is they studied it and they realized this is a way of really bothering people kind of thing. So, you know, Meinhof was in these conditions for almost a year. and She thought she might be going crazy at the end of the year. Uh, but, you know, it wasn't just her. And fairly quickly, the RAF prisoners realized that, you know, they're being targeted. Like, their lawyers visit them, and they say, it's not just you. It's the other people in your group also. They, you all have these weird conditions kind of thing. And so the RAF prisoners decide, you know, to do something about it. So the first thing, you know, the first sign this takes publicly is they go on hunger strike in 1972. And after a few weeks, you know, the state kind of agrees to review something and they end their hunger strike and the state says, well, we only kind of agreed to think about reviewing things. We're not actually changing anything. So yeah, uh, so nothing really changes. So they go back on hunger strike in 1973. Pretty much same deal, the vague government promises kind of thing. Maybe one or two people have their conditions improve, but you know, by and large, most of them are still in solitary. Uh, but these hunger strikes, they weren't failures for all that because during these hunger strikes, the RAF prisoners are reaching out to people on the outside. It's like a hunger strike's a good way to get people speaking about you, speaking about why you're in prison, and they start having people who support them as political prisoners, and they're really uh, rude to these people often. Like, they, they're not saying, oh, thank you for helping us fight against solitary confinement. They're saying, you know, if you're only against solitary confinement, if you're only against torture in prison, you're a liberal. You're like a bourgeois humanitarian kind of thing. We don't want your support. Yeah, uh, you know, not polite. <laughs> you know, they're saying, you know, we have politics beyond that, and we actually want people who support all of our politics. Uh, and, you know, they publicly denounce some political prisoner support groups for just being against torture or whatnot. Um, you know, it's not nice, and it's not necessarily, but wasn't necessarily meant as part of a conscious process, but definitely does have a result. And you see that result in 1974, because in 1974 they go on hunger strike again. And after a few weeks, this guy, this RAF prisoner, Holger Mainz, who was super well known in the student movement, 
before he joined the RAF, he dies. Uh, he'd been force-fed for weeks, but they weren't giving him enough nutrition. This weird police unit called the Bomb Security Group, which was in charge, amongst other things, of like political prisoners and things like that, they refused to allow him to be transferred to a hospital. So he dies in prison, and uh, suddenly the support scene on the outside, uh, you know, explodes. Like, you know, the moment the word hits the street that prisoners died, people start putting together Molotov cocktails and going out to riot kind of thing. The next day, this other group tries to kidnap a judge in West Berlin. The judge resists. They kill him. Uh, you know, there's little attacks here and there throughout Western Europe against West German targets. So, and in the context of all of this, some people who'd been doing political prisoner support work start dropping out of sight. And we know now what is that they were planning. They, they basically felt prisoners died. We haven't been doing enough. We need to, you know, renew this project, the Red Army faction, to try and get prisoners out. Uh, the first sign of this comes months later. Uh, so in February 1975, the strike's still going on, so people have been force-fed for months now. Uh, no one else has died, but they're not in great shape. And then a letter appears, uh, signed by this group everyone thought didn't exist anymore, the Red Army faction, and, and kind of macho language, they say, you know, we order our prisoners to start eating again, we're going to settle this with our weapons. Um, the prisoners start eating, and what they mean by that becomes clear soon enough. A bunch of people travel from West Germany to Sweden, to the capital city of Stockholm, they go into the West German embassy, they take out guns, they take hostages. Uh, the cops come into the embassy, the cops are told to leave, they don't leave, so the RAF, because it's the RAF doing this, they take the military affairs attaché and they shoot him through the head. Uh, so the cops leave at that point. Um, they, at that point, they say, we booby trap the embassy. If anyone tries to come in, it's got to blow up. Uh, and they demand that the RAF prisoners in West Germany be released to whatever country will take them. So there's hours of negotiations. Uh, late that night, you know, they feel things aren't going anywhere, so they take the economic affairs attaché and they kill him. At which point they release the secretaries, so they're only holding diplomats, and at that point it's unclear what happened. Uh, we know West Germany flew in special police units, uh, basically the equivalent of SWAT units. Uh, the RAF would say that the cops tried to enter the embassy. Uh, the cops would always say the RAF just didn't know what they were doing when they laid their explosives. But, I mean, the thing is, the embassy exploded. Uh, miraculously, only one person, a RAF member, was killed in the explosion. But all of the other RAF members are caught. And one other RAF member, this guy Siegfried Hausner, he has burns over most of his body. He has a fractured skull. Despite this, him and the other RAF people, they're flown from Sweden, from hospital you know, their hospital rooms in Sweden to prisons in West Germany. And Siegfried Hausner dies, you know, in Stamheim prison a few days later. He needed to be in an ICU, not in a prison, you know, sick bay. And, uh, you know, I mean, when I heard about this action, I thought it was a really horrible action. You know, I mean, for one, I don't like the idea of shooting people through the head. Uh, for two, you know, the goal is to get people out of prison, and it just seemed, you know, by that standard, it was a failure. No one's out of prison. More people are in prison, plus, you know, two people on your side, like on the rest side, are dead. I just couldn't understand why they didn't either stop then or just stop doing, trying to get people out of prison with these actions then kind of thing, because it just seemed a real failure. Um, but one thing I learned while doing this book sort that I think I learned is that when I have a reaction like that, it's not so much about me, you know, as it is about just, you know, my context kind of thing. In a different context, I might feel differently. Uh, because, you know, in West Germany at the time, a lot of people actually felt differently about this action. It wasn't seen as a failure. Like the RAF prisoners who they were trying to free kind of felt, well, they felt two things. On the one hand, they felt you've really unmasked the supposedly left-wing social democratic government of West Germany. You know, you've shown that they were, you know, willing to send in the cops and, you know, 
risk everyone dying rather than free political prisoners. And they also felt, you know, really moved and encouraged by the fact that people <coughs> who in many cases they hadn't known personally beforehand were willing to risk their lives, willing to give their lives even to get them out of prison. So it really broke through the sense of isolation that the government had been trying to build up around them. At the same time, you know, it's not only really true in Western, you know, I think in every society at every time we have lots of people who are living in a legal gray zone. It's like they're not at war against the state, but they're also, you know, not obeying the law in their day-to-day -day life kind of thing. And one thing that was special about the radical left in those days, uh, not just in West Germany, but also in West Germany, is there were lots of people on the radical left living in that legal gray zone. Uh, and a lot of those people at that time, in 1975, they looked at Stockholm and their reaction was to think, you know, wow, like less than a dozen people managed that. You know, it seems like they were only planning it for a few months. You know, imagine the possibilities kind of thing. If there were more of us, if, you know, we thought more about it. Um, so for a lot of people, it actually either opens the door or keeps open the door to the idea of this kind of armed activity, uh, and specifically in terms of freeing prisoners. Um, whether they'd have done anything or not, if things had just stayed at that point, impossible to say, because like the, this entire story in the 1970s is a story of like one thing after another, like, you know, pushing things forward. It's like an overdetermined story in a sense, because, you know, the next thing that happens is in 1976, uh, it's four years after most of the RAF people had been arrested. And finally, the so-called ringleaders uh, have a trial. And they're considered too dangerous to allow have, be allowed to have a trial in a courthouse. There's a special building built on the prison grounds for them. And it's like, it's a crazy trial by West German standards. They pass a whole bunch of new laws just for this trial, um, amongst which suddenly barring lawyers from defending more than one defendant on similar charges related to terrorism kind of thing. So, you know, you have prisoners who suddenly, you know, they don't have a lawyer. Uh, you know, it gets revealed close to the end of this trial that one of the judges is leaking confidential court documents to the Springer Press, to the same right-wing newspaper chain which had been bombed. And yeah, so, you know, it's uh, like, again, when we were researching the first volume, the issue of like the Sunday Times, I think, the, this British like news magazine, you know, their title for the trial was show trial. So, you know, it was an exceptional trial and the prisoners were putting forward kind of a standard political prisoner defense, which they, they weren't saying they didn't do it. They were kind of like saying why they felt justified to have done it. They were saying, you know, West Germany is an illegitimate government, <coughs> set up by the United States after World War II, you know, complicit with US war crimes around the world. Uh, CIA involved in domestic politics, the whole shebang kind of thing. And uh, if, if you remember, Ulrika Meinhof had been a journalist, and she'd also been politically active on the left for years, so she actually knew some people who are now in the social democratic government and everything. So she was really well placed, you know, and she apparently was really intrinsic to working on this defense. And then just at the point that the prisoners would later say this defense was going to like reach its you know, this conclusion and everything was going to come to a head, uh, it's announced that Ulrika Meinhof won't be showing up in court anymore because she was found dead in her prison cell. Um, so according to the state, and, you know, there's this entire cycle babble explanation that exists now that she killed herself on Mother's Day because she feel, felt guilty about her twin daughters being raised by her sleazeball ex because she'd become a revolutionary girl. Um, but, you know, that, that's kind of the state story. Uh, at the time, <coughs> everyone on the radical left felt she'd been killed. And it's not proof that she was killed, but the state really added to this perception just by acting super arrogantly, by insisting that their doctor do the autopsy before the family's doctor, and then, you know, certain tissues just weren't there anymore for the family's doctor. Uh, insisting that her lawyer or family members not be allowed into the cell where she allegedly hanged herself until, you know, after they've taken everything out and even repainted it. So it's like, you know, folks think there's a cover-up. Even 
folks who don't like the raft. Like Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir in France write this public letter saying, we think she was killed, we think there's a cover-up, you know, and all of this. And some of those people who, you know, had looked at Stockholm and thought, well, maybe we can do better, they're like, wow, geez, you know, a prisoner's dead because we didn't do better. It's like, you know, we have to do something or the prisoners are all going to be killed. So they start making concrete plans. And in 1977, finally, they're ready to go into action. And the form this takes is a series of, you know, bloody attacks against the state to pressure the state to release prisoners or improve their conditions. So the first thing is the Attorney General of West Germany, uh, this guy Siegfried Buback, former member of the Nazi SS, which wasn't really unusual for government officials at the time. He was held responsible by the RAF and by a lot of the left for like prison conditions for the deaths in prison of Holger Mainz and Siegfried Hausner and Ulrika Meinhof. He's waiting at a traffic light. Motorcycle drives up beside his car. They take out a submachine gun. They riddle the car with bullets. His chauffeur is dead. His bodyguard is dead. He's dead. Um, second RAF action, they try to kidnap a banker. Uh, this guy Jürgen Palanto, he resists, he's shot dead. Next, they try to attack the offices of the next attorney general. They rig a homemade missile launcher with a, yeah, with a timing device. They aim it at his offices, but the timing device fails, so that doesn't work. But their next attack, at least initially, does work, and that is they uh, ambush, killing the police escort, killing a his bodyguards and chauffeur, they ambush and kidnap the most powerful businessman in West Germany at the time. This guy Hans Martin Schleier was his name. In World War II, he'd been a mid to high level official in the Nazi SS. He'd been in charge of Germanizing uh, <coughs> the economy of what in 1977 was Czechoslovakia. He, uh, you know, he was a part of the state. He wasn't elected, but he was more powerful than most politicians. He was after the war, his Nazi past was forgiven. He was allowed to have a nice career. And by 1977, he was president of the Employers Association, president of the Industrialists Association. He was on TV or in the newspapers every week, you know, representing the business community. Uh, you know, and now the RAF had him. And in a, you know, in a document, they, a tiny little letter, basically, that they leave at the site of this massacre, you know, where they grabbed him, uh, they basically say they want their prisoners released again to whatever country will take them and that you know they also don't want the cops to try and find them or they'll kill Schleier. Suddenly there's like police with submachine guns on almost every street corner. Uh, there's barbed wire going up around government buildings. Uh, there's tanks going down the streets in like West Germany and Normally, the West German government takes months to pass new legislation. In a few days, they pass a law called the Contact Ban Law, which targets political prisoners like the RAF prisoners. Suddenly, the RAF prisoners, they're, with this Contact Ban Law, they're not allowed any visits with anyone, including lawyers. Uh, they're not allowed access to radio, television, newspaper. The idea is they're in 100% isolation, no contact with anyone that guards or, you know, occasionally government representatives who go and like visit them and say, what are we got to do about this horrible hostage taking? Um, you know, it's referred to in lots of accounts as like a counter kidnapping by the state because no one could, you know, speak to or even find out what conditions the prisoners were, were in anymore. Um, the RAF had said, you know, don't look for us or we got to kill them, but I mean, the state is looking for them. It's like, you know, Suddenly, everyone on the radical left is being, you know, tailed by cops, you know, 24-7. And, you know, the idea was maybe people would lead them to the RAF, which isn't the case because the RAF has no contact with anyone, you know, during this period. But they're also looking for the RAF, and they catch some people during this period. And, you know, the RAF had said, you know, we're going to kill him if you do this, but the RAF doesn't kill him because, you know, he's, he's all they have in a sense. They, they need Schleier to in the hopes that prisoners will be released. Um, everyone I've spoken to who was like active in the radical left at the time in West Germany like remembers this as a nightmare. It's like the entire society 
seemed de facto martial law. Everyone expected there to be like an official suspension of like bourgeois democracy and Germany would revert to being a dictatorship. Everyone expected everyone to be rounded up at any moment. Um, you know, it was a terrifying time and no one really felt capable of, you know, dealing with the situation. And, you know, the, for the RAF too, they'd said, you know, free, free our prisoners quickly or we kill Schleier, but, you know, we end our, la our first volume with, you know, this 1977 offensive. Like, they, they release, you know, it must be, you know, close to a dozen communiques over a period of weeks, and by the end of it, it's desperate kind of thing. It's, you know, you can tell they're like, it's practically like, why don't you believe that we'll kill him kind of thing, you know, release our prisoners or else, but it's like, it's been weeks of you guys saying this, you know, the government's kind of calling your bluff. And so what they do in this situation, where things aren't working out as they hoped, is they reach out to some other people for help. They reach out to a group based in the Middle East called the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine External Operations. And it really pissed us off during the first volume. All of the, all of the accounts we could read in English referred to this as the PFLP, which it's not. The PFLP, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, is a very large organization, which at the time was led by this guy, George Habash. <coughs> Tons of support uh, amongst the Palestinian population. The PFLP EO is a tiny, was a tiny group which left the PFLP in the early 70s because the EO part, the external operations, they did stuff outside the Middle East, which Habash's PFLP had a ban on. And because the PFLP EO did stuff outside the Middle East, they had contact with groups like the RAF, which, you know, were active outside the Middle East. So it's to them that the RAF go in 77 saying, can you help us? Because, you know, we're in a jam. And the PFLPEO, they turn around and they give some options and the RAF picks one. And the one they pick is that an airplane, like not full of people who were in the Nazi SS or bankers or politicians or whatever, but full of regular folks on their way home from a vacation uh, on this you know, Mediterranean island of Majorca. This plane gets hijacked and it gets diverted to the Middle East and from the Middle East to the capital city of Somalia, Mogadishu. The PFLPO guerrillas who'd hijacked it, they say, we want two of our prisoners in Turkey released and we want the RAF prisoners released. This is an action in solidarity with the RAF. Um, do this or the hostages die. Oh my God. Um, yeah, it's like everyone on the radical left beforehand was like living in a nightmare kind of thing in West Germany, and suddenly it's gotten so much worse. It's like, people just can't, don't know what to do. You know, I mean, it's like all of the oxygen got sucked out of the world kind of thing. It's like, and I mean, the one player who knows what to do is the government. The government sends its special anti-terrorist unit, GSG-9, to Mogadishu, and GSG-9 in the middle of the night raid the airplane. And, you know, they kill three of the four guerrillas, they capture the fourth, and to this day, in like counterinsurgency schools and counterinsurgency manuals, the Mogadishu rescue is like the model rescue because the hostages were traumatized, but none of them were killed. I mean, the pilot had been killed previously, but in the raid by GSG-9, you know, none of the hostages are killed. Um, you know, the government the next day, the next morning, press conference, it's what you'd expect. You know, we have one that evil terrorists have lost kind of thing, the hostages are safe. And then almost as an afterthought, they're like, you know, those, uh, you know, paraphrasing here, but you know, those other evil terrorists, the, the RAF prisoners, all of this fuss is because of them. Well, last night, the ringleaders decided to commit suicide. So according to the government in Stamheim prison, which was the most high security prison in Western Europe, Andreas Bader and Jan Karl Rasp had managed to get guns months earlier, smuggled in by lawyers. And they'd hidden those guns, according to the government, for months, even though their cells were searched, and even though they were switched from one cell to another. And on the night in question, they shot themselves through the head, uh, and Gudrun Enslin hanged herself. And remember, like, they're not supposed to have access to media. So, you know, it begs the question, how did they know that they weren't about to be released? How did they know that there had been a hostage taking of this airplane and that hadn't worked out. So 
you know, according to the government, Jan Karl Rasp not only had smug, you know, hidden a gun for months, he'd hidden tools he'd stolen in the prison months earlier before the contact ban went into place. And once the contact ban was there, he took out the tools and surreptitiously he built like a shortwave radio receiver and also a telegraph system so he could communicate with the other prisoners. Could you say that again? <laughs> <laughs> Jan Karl Rasp, so one of the RAF supposed ringleaders kind of thing, which was a term they hated because they always said, we don't have leaders, we're all equals. But you know, one of these prisoners in Stamheim prison, months earlier there'd been construction work being done at the prison. And the government story was he'd stolen tools like screwdriver, hammer, saw, whatever kind of thing. And that he'd hidden these tools, and that once the contact ban was in place, he used these tools to open up the wall in his cell and take out wires, and he could make both a shortwave radio receiver and also some kind of like Morse code system or something like that to talk to the other prisoners. So to that, go in a joint pact of suicide. Yeah, to make a suicide pact, and to also find out what was happening with this airplane hijacking. Um, I mean, it sounds unbelievable, and it uh, sounds more unbelievable with what I'm about to tell you next. The government then says, you know, our cameras in that floor of the prison malfunctioned that night. Uh, and, you know, the cherry on the cake, if you will, is there's a fourth RAF prisoner on that floor of the prison, this woman, Ermgard Moiler. The government says that she smuggled a knife from her food tray that she, she kept it. And you'd imagine in a high security prison, this isn't going to be the sharpest knife in the world, but nevertheless, that night she apparently stabs herself repeatedly through the chest with this knife. Um, but the thing is, she doesn't die. So a few days later, she comes to in a hospital, and she has her lawyer release a statement saying, I wasn't aware of any suicide pact. I didn't try and kill myself. I was attacked. I believe it was some kind of government death squad or something. You know, I mean, you can understand the idea from the government's perspective. You're going to like mess up our entire society to you know, free your crazy prisoners. We'll just make sure you have no more prisoners left to free. Um, so, something I, I want to say, which I don't want to get into now, we can in the Q&A, though I can't really explain it even then, is like I've presented kind of like a case of how ridiculous this is. I've done that so that you can understand that everyone on the radical left at the time again feel these people have been killed and that there's a government cover-up. Today we don't know anything that wasn't really known by 1978. The government story has always been lawyers smuggled in guns and all of this. Uh, and at the time most people thought this was nuts. Like even people on the right, like I even like read memoirs by people claiming to be C former CIA agents in which they kind of say, yeah, we knew they killed the prisoners and all of this kind of thing. But you know, today, almost everyone, including people on the radical left, including even some former RAF people say, we actually believe they did commit suicide. So it's just this massive shift. In thanks life. to that film too, I think that potentially. Yeah, thanks in part to the film, and there were other films in Germany, and thanks in part to just, I think, it's just the nature of like consciousness, like, you know, what you think is possible changes in time. And, you know, it's like we, Working, you know, working on these books, we've had contact with former political prisoners who say, you know, we think they committed suicide. We actually do think they were that good. And there's kind of also a theory which is floated, which I think a lot of people rally to, not because it necessarily is true, but just because it's emotionally satisfying, which is that the government facilitated them committing suicides. The government found out that there was an idea of a suicide pact ahead of time and said, well, actually, we're willing to let them smuggle in guns and everything if, it, if they're just going to kill themselves with them. So this is kind of like the theory that Stefan Aust, whose book the film is based on, that he says he believes. You know, but there's no proof of this. You Were know. the lawyers ever charged? And did they ever the, have any evidence that that could have actually lawyers, lawyers were charged, and legal assistants were charged. And one of the things is there's a history of legal assistants joining the RAF. So there's a history of legal assistants. <laughs> Because you can see why. There's, there's also a history of people supporting political prisoners becoming legal assistants kind of thing. Uh, there's one lawyer who joined the RAF. Uh, but other than that, no. And lawyers did do jail time uh, around this and also simply around defending the RAF. Lawyers would do jail time the same way that Lynn Stewart kind of thing here. Uh, two legal assistants or former legal assistants testify that they smuggled in, like they say, we personally smuggled in these weapons. 
And the thing you have to understand is it doesn't mean that they're lying, but they were facing, you know, years in prison for supporting a terrorist organization. And because of their testimony, they basically don't get any prison time. They get new identities and they get, in one case at least, they get like cash from the government to relocate. Um, so it doesn't mean they're lying. You know, maybe they smuggled in the weapons, and they, but it's kind of like the testimony, you know, it, it casts some doubt over the testimony because they certainly, you know, it was in their self-interest. In one case, like, yeah. In one case, the government was also threatening, like, to take their kid away and all, you know, so it's, uh, so it's not clear cut. And I can't say what happened one way or another. It's, uh, you know, but whichever way it happened, the prisoners were dead. Like, that much, you know, is incontrovertible. And that was a disaster for the RAF. And that was a disaster for the radical left. And that was a disaster for the other RAF prisoners, because there's still lots of other RAF prisoners who didn't commit suicide or get killed that night. And a bigger catastrophe is that, you know, becomes clear very soon, which is that a lot of people who'd approved of the RAF really didn't approve of this idea of hijacking airplanes. And, you know, when the RAF prisoners have their funeral, some people, you know, tons of people go to their funeral and some people go with a banner which basically says, we denounce deaths in prison, we denounce hijacking airplanes. Uh, you know, for years, the kind of, like, kind of sexist cliche that people defending armed struggle would put forward is, you know, the little old lady selling flowers on the street corner has nothing to fear from the gorilla. But, you know, obviously if she was on her way home from Mallorca that day, yeah. she had something to fear from the gorilla. So, you know, this does, like, a lot of damage on, on a political level to the RAF. And it probably becomes even harder for the, I mean, the RAF folks at large kind of thing, they kill Schleier once the prisoners once it's announced the prisoners are dead. Uh, but, you know, it's really hard for them. Like, they, there's a letter smuggled out from another RAF prisoner to them in which this RAF prisoner is saying, we discussed hijacking airplanes and we decided we didn't do that kind of thing. We disapproved of that kind of action. The prisoners who just, you know, died in prison had decided that they disapproved of that kind of action. Like, you've really messed things up by doing this. Um, so it's hard. For them and you know it's hard for them also in a practical way the cops are out to get them the cops make it really clear they're happy to not take prisoners it's like there are raft people who are killed who have no gun on them you know o over the next two years it, that's okay there's you know there's a, a raft member who opens the door to a safe house and the cops are waiting they just shoot him through the head uh you know the mo you know what I mean? It's uh, miraculously he's, he survives, though with you know massive amounts of damage. But you know, and he's in prison, uh, so it's a hard time. It'll be two years before the RAF try another armed action, and it'll be you know four years before they actually manage anything that works. And